Well, it's been good to be in the house of the Lord already, amen? I enjoyed the service this morning. I did. I, I like to see when the Lord gets on somebody because he has a tendency to jump on me when he does that too, and I can feel it. And, and so I'm thankful for it. And you're wondering maybe, well, is the Lord going to show up tonight? Well, we've got the Word of God. And we've got the church of God. I reckon it depends on whether we got three people in here that wants to be with God. Amen. If we can meet those three requirements, I think God will show up. He always does. Now, before I preach tonight, I, I want you to know I appreciate my pastor and his wife and every one of you. And you've been a blessing to the mission in Haiti that God gave us a, a long time ago. So uh, a lot of people ask me how much money was raised with the tickets. And I think it was $8,600. And uh, uh, Brother Chapman, matter of fact, from the church, he won the TV from this, this section of the tickets. And so we're thankful for that. And then that leaves us about $1,600 short. And uh, a, a, a dear sister friend of mine gave us an envelope with $500 in it that she'd raised. And then a, a friend I hadn't seen in a long time uh, uh, that I'd went to church with probably when we first came down here and the Lord gave us a ministry in Haiti. He, he sent us a an envelope and a card, and it had a thousand dollars in it. God's good, isn't it? I've 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 told the board for for decades now. I said I'm not worried about the money. We if we'll it will do God's work in God's way. God will give us the supply everything that we need, and He's been faithful. So I'm thankful for that. Uh, if you have your Bibles tonight, please turn to Mark chapter number 10. Mark chapter number 10. And we'll begin reading at verse number 17. And we'll go down through, uh, I guess, verse number 22 or so until the Lord puts the brakes on. Mark chapter number 10 and beginning at verse number 17. The Bible says, And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good Master, what shall I do that I might inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. Now this, this one right here really amazed me. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Now that's give me a that's give me a, a particular battle through the years. I've been digging into that thing for years trying to make some of these verses fit in to what's going on here. So I think the Lord, Lord's going to help us tonight if you've been wondering the same thing. And then Jesus behold him. Now that's after he said he had, he had kept all these commandments that was listed there. It says, Jesus beholding him loved him. Isn't that just like Jesus? He loved him. And said unto him, One thing thou lackest, Go thy way, sell whatsoever thou havest, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord. I thank you for the privilege to stand tonight. God, I, I realize. I realize there's never any preaching done in the house of God 
unless your Holy Spirit guides it and directs it and gives it the power of God. Lord, I confess tonight, I, I don't know how to preach. I, I have never learned, Lord. But God, I do know that you called me. And I ask once again, Lord, that you'd bathe us in that calling. God, that you'd give us something that might help the people. Now, God, the devil don't like the preach word of God. He don't like God's people coming to hear the preach word of God. And so we claim the blood of Jesus Christ. We ask for a protective hedge here tonight. We ask that the devil have no place here to interfere. And God, we'll, we'll be careful once again to give you the praise and the glory. For you alone deserve it. And we want to praise the name of thy blessed Son, Jesus, tonight. And we ask in his holy, precious, sweet name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, the scripture we just read together tonight is a very familiar scripture. It's the account, the Bible says, of the rich young ruler. That's what we talk about, a rich young ruler. Now, I told you I've had a problem with this. I've marked it and been going over it, and it's been a long time that I've been digging into it. And as I remember, 90% of the sermons I've heard from Mark chapter number 10 has to deal with the dangers of loving money, craving money. It shows the dangers of how it can cause a problem to be a disciple of God and yet crave and hunger after oil. But as I've thought on this for years and years, and as I did this time when the Lord took me to this scripture, I knew there had to be more than that. There has to be more in that verse of scripture, those several little readings that we had, than what people's been preaching. So I prayed. I said, God, we've been doing this a long time. I still have not gleaned what I, I think might be in there. It's got to be deeper than that. And, and I guess I never was deep enough in my walk with God to be able to see it. And so he began to speak to my heart. Now, I want you to notice something tonight. First of all, the Bible tells us he came running. Now, he didn't just lollygag. He heard Jesus was passing through that area in the way. And when he heard that, he had an urgency to him. He didn't just walk. He was running. Now, you can say, well, how fast was he running? I don't know. But it was faster than a walker. The Bible wouldn't have said he ran. Amen. So he was urgent. He was running. He did not want Jesus to pass by without he had an opportunity to ask him some questions. Amen. I say tonight to be, this world is full of lost folk that need to be running to Jesus. There is ever a time that a lost person needs to be running to Jesus. I believe it's in this time that we're living in now. You say, well, preacher, all you preachers keep saying Jesus is coming soon. Well, he is. And it surprises me, Pastor Lawson, every single time I get up in the morning, I'm surprised that he has not come. But the Bible says he that will come, shall come, and shall not tarry. Right. So there's a reason Jesus hasn't come. There's a reason he hasn't appeared yet. And I believe he was trying to take care of some of that this morning when he touched the pastor's heart with so much compassion and he said, somebody needs something from the Lord and in my heart, I felt like it was salvation, pastor. I, I felt that conviction that I felt when salvation is in the house of God. And yet somebody left. I, 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 I did not hear anybody getting born again this morning. May I also say this man was running to Jesus, and they'd be a lot of be a good thing. A lot of church folk ran to Jesus. Yeah. Pastor told you that preachers are able to see faces, and after a while, he's right. We'll see the smiles, we'll see the grimaces, 
We'll see the conviction. We'll see the anger. And we'll see the I just don't know what to do is in their face. And you know something I saw missing a lot here lately, even though we're getting closer and closer and closer to the return of the blessed Lamb of God. You don't see much joy. There's a sadness to the look. Listen, God's been good to me. Amen. Amen. And He's been good to y'all. I've been coming here a pretty good while now. And you know what? I've never seen a person here that I couldn't say that God had blessed them in some way during those years. And He's not only blessed them, but over and over and over again. So it says this, this young man, when he heard Jesus was coming through the way, he's going to pass that way, he said, I'm not going to miss Jesus. And so according to that, he took off and he went to run. Now that's good, wouldn't you think? That, that seems to be a good thing, doesn't it? He, he wants to get to Jesus as fast as he can. Secondly, I want you to notice that uh, he not only ran to Jesus, but he did something that the church, the world, <laughs> this universe should be doing. Right. He kneeled, didn't he? Amen. He bent a knee to the Lord. Now, I don't know about you, if you're wanting to talk to Jesus and you want to get his attention, you bend that knee to Jesus and he'll stop and he'll give you an audience right then because you're showing reverence. You're, you're showing that he's revered above your, your greatness that you think you have. And he realizes that there's a humbleness to that. And doesn't he promise a contrite and humble heart is what he's looking for? Amen. He dwells in a contrite and humble heart. Amen. So again, that's, that's good, right? Sounds like this young man's right on line. Next notice, he not only kneeled, but he called him good master. Now, that sounds good, doesn't it? But I got to thinking about that. Here's where we got, start going just a little bit wrong. And what this young man's doing. You see, this is a Jew, a young man that's a Jew that was born under the law, that was raised under the law, that is presently trying to live the law. And when he calls him good master, what he's saying is good teacher. And Jesus is a good teacher. He wrote the book. Amen. Yeah. But to him, that's not what Jesus was looking for. He was a Jew saying, good teacher. Huh? He never once called him Lord up to this point. Not one time. What happened to Paul when Paul got arrested on the way to Damascus going to kill a bunch of Christians, take them back and, and, and just do away with them? God blinded him. God put him down. And he said, Lord, what would you have me to do? There's a difference in Good teacher and Lord. There's a difference there. You say, Tom, you're, you're, you're picking at little things. Just stay with me. I'm not. We're going to get somewhere with it in just a minute. At first glance, it looked like he's on the fast track to a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's what salvation's about, isn't it? It's not about the do's and don'ts, the wills and won'ts, the cans and can'ts. It's about a personal, everyday relationship with Jesus Christ where he's first in our lives no matter what part of our life he's in. Amen. Isn't that really salvation? Okay, so it looks, like he's, looks to me like he's doing good. But yet through all the years, Pastor, it never settled in my heart. That everything was just right here. It just didn't go right. This is full. This country, this world is full of people. They truly in their hearts believe that he's a good man. Amen? 
A Muslim will tell you he's a good man. A Muslim will tell you that he's a good teacher. No denying it. But a Muslim will never bow his knee and call him Lord. So you see, we've got, we've got some things going awry already in this, this verse of Scripture God's gave us. You know what? You can think Jesus is a good man. I mean 100% be convicted of it. And you can think Jesus is a good teacher. But do you know you can miss heaven? Believe in those two things? Because he wants to be more than a good teacher to you. He wants to be more than just a good man that lived without sin. He wants to be your Lord and your Savior. Amen. Amen. Now watch this. Watch this. He's been asking Jesus questions up to here, hasn't he? He asked him a question again. Jesus does. Why callest thou me good? Isn't that strange? Jesus is who? God manifest in the flesh. God came down from glory, took on a body of flesh that was prepared for him, lived without sin, and says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's about as clear as you can get, right? He's God. So why does he tell this young Jew that seems to be trying to get his attention and get down to the nitty gritty with some things, why does Jesus look over at him knowing fully that he is God and tell him, why do you call me good? Right there's where I started jumping. I said, okay, Lord, I've never seen that part yet. I've never seen that. You're God, but yet you're asking him, why do you call me good? There's nothing good but one. And his name is God. Right? Because the man has never got himself in a position up to this point to where he's Lord to him. Now keep this, stay with me a minute. Then Jesus does something else. Did you notice he not only asked a question? But he gave him the answer to the question. He said, now, Brother Tom, what's he up to? Well, Jesus is taking this man that was born a Jew under the law and that has been raised in a family of Jews under the law and has lived his whole young life up to this point trying to keep the Ten Commandments. He's leading him to a place where he's going to have to make a decision here. Just like every one of you here at made when you accepted Christ. And if you're here this morning rejected, he brought you up to a point of this same way so that he could show you what was missing and what you believed and what you thought and what you felt and to bring you to a point to where he could make you have to make a decision. You can't be neutral. People try to be neutral to Christ, but there's no neutral. You're in, you're out. He that's for us, sitting against us. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son hath not life. Amen. There's no neutral. Matter of fact, neutral is over with. You're going to have to make a decision about Christ. No way around it. Jesus is getting down to the heart of the problem, isn't he? See, he had to do the same thing to me. You know, I, I, I had a head knowledge of Christ. I really did. I, I took sport dealing with Christians that didn't read their Bible. Does that sound bad? I did. And because of that, I thought I was in. You know what I found out, Pastor Lawson? I was way out. You say, well, how far was you out? About this distance right here. You say, well, that's not way out. Either you have Christ or you don't have Christ. 
That's as far out as you need to bust tail wide open, amen. I said, Brother Tom, you're real serious about this, aren't you? Absolutely. Somebody needed to get saved this morning. Somebody need to bend their knee and run to Jesus and for the first time in their life, call Him Lord. And they left here without doing that. And that's troubled me all day long. And you ask him a crest, next question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, he's asking a question that he ought to be able to answer because after all, you can't inherit something unless you're a member of the family, right? You're a member of that family to inherit it. And if it's not a gift, for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not a works lest any man should boast. If it's not a gift, then it's by works. And that makes God a liar and his word a liar. Good question. Been born under law, living under law, looking. What he was doing was looking for some work, some part he could have in salvation. So he could leave there feeling like he was saved. Does anybody else ever wonder about all this going on or am I just crazy sometimes? I don't, I don't know. But I had to find out. Jesus says, you know the commandments. I guarantee you a Jew born under the law, raised in a family of Jews, under the law, trying to keep the commandments, I guarantee you he knew every single one of them without a problem. Amen. Now watch what Jesus does. This is what blew my mind. Pastor, I never jumped this before. I know that you may not, none of you get anything of this, but when I jumped this, watch what he reads, he says, quotes to him. He said, you know the commandments. He says, do not commit adultery. One. One, right? Yeah. Do not kill. Two commandments. Do not steal. Three commandments. Do not bear false witness. Four commandments, right? Defraud not. Five. And honor thy father and thy mother. Six. Now when that young Jew, born under the law, trying to fulfill the law and do the Ten Commandments, he makes this statement. He said, I've kept them all since my youth. Man. But I got a question for you. Did you catch what the problem was there? We only counted six commandments. No. Did Jesus forget the other folk? No, he gave them. So what's Jesus up to? He's bringing this young man to a point to where he's going to have to make a decision. And it says when he looked at him, he loved him. That was quite a thing to be able to keep six of them, wasn't it? You mess one of them up, you mess the whole Ten Commandments up. But he was able, and must have been rightfully so, Jesus did not correct him. He said, I've kept them all. I've not been that good all my life. I've had trouble keeping all the commandments. I've, I don't think it can be done by, by a human, but he says, teacher, again, master, Master, teacher, same thing. I've observed all of them since my youth. Then verse 21, it says, Jesus, behold him, looked at his heart and loved him. But I wonder, I just wonder, why did Jesus leave out four of the commandments? Do you know what all those other six commandments had to do with? Have you ever thought about it? Or have you ever jumped it? Or are you just not as crazy as I am wanting to dig into stuff all the time. I, 
I got to know. How. When I was a kid, people didn't want me to come to the house. I tore stuff apart trying to figure it out. I did. They put stuff up high when Tom Berry come over to the house a little. Do you ever wonder why, why it's that way? Every one of those commandments had to do with man's relationship to man. Think about it. Not one thing in there was mentioned about the Lord thy God. It was all when Jesus read those. All six of them was to have, having to do with how one person treats another person according to the commandments. The court, four commandments that relate the relationship between man and God weren't common. He said, what were they? Well, watch this and I'll prove what I'm saying to you. One, you shall love no other gods before me. Two, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. Number three, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Number four, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. All of those have to do with your relationship, how you treat God. There it is. I, just, I, I said, Lord, I've never seen it. I've never seen it. Maybe everybody else has seen this. If you did, I wish you'd have come and told me. It, it would have saved me years of digging to find it. Now, did Jesus forget him? No. He gave him the, five, the six that he could so that he'd say that. But him being a Jew, and him knowing all ten of them, that had to, that had to prick his conscience. That had to get him thinking, why didn't he give out the other four? Now I want you to go to verse number 21 here. And this is what Jesus says. He puts his finger on the problem. Somebody here had something, something that was holding them back this morning or somebody on the radio or somebody on the, 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 the computer system. Somebody was holding on to something thinking they were all right. And it was keeping them from calling Jesus Lord. Watch what he says. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest. Just one. Right? Watch this. One thing thou lackest. Go thy way. Sell whosoever thou hast, whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Now, he didn't tell him to give up all this stuff and he wasn't going to have any treasure. It was just going to be a different type of treasure. Right. It was going to be a treasure that lasted forever and ever and ever. Your Jesus will never ask you to give up something unless he's got something better. Amen. And give to the poor, and thou hast to have treasure in heaven, and come. Now watch this. This is something else that got me. Take up the cross and follow me. The cross and follow me. Well, I don't know whether you flip back a couple pages with me to Mark chapter number 8, when he's speaking to the disciples about the cost of discipleship. He says in verse number 34, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself. Okay. You ready? And take up his cross and follow me. Now, is that a discrepancy in the Word of God? No, there is no discrepancy. I want to explain something to you. It's very simple. Jesus can't tell you or show you or give you what your cross is to take up until you first embrace and reach out to and take up the cross. Because on the cross, Jesus Christ had your sin. On the cross, Jesus Christ died for your sin. And on the cross, Jesus Christ relieved you of the penalty of those sins. So that's not a discrepancy. You can't pick up your cross until you embrace the cross that the Son of God hung on for the remission of your sin. 
That's simple, isn't it? Well, I'm about as simple a preacher as you'll ever run across. I am. Mistake, no mistake. No mistake. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Jesus don't want a part of you. He don't want most of you. Jesus wants all of you Amen. and all of me. Why? Is that because, because he deserves it? Well, he does. Amen. He paid it all, so he ought to get it all. Amen. Amen. No, he wants you, all of you, every little bit of you, all you were, all you was, all you hope to be, everything that you will be, He wants it all because when He gets all of you and He gets all of me, we get all of Him and He can bless us fully the way He wants. Now, if you ain't got no joy, maybe He ain't got all of you. I believe there's a verse of Scripture when he's speaking to the churches in the book of Revelations where he says something to one church and says, I have one thing against you, you've lost your first love. Well, if you fell out of love with Jesus, then he no longer has what? I love you. Do y'all remember when you got saved? If people didn't love Jesus, I was truly a thorn in their flesh. Well, I run up to people, Kathy and I'd see them in Bristol. I haven't been in Bristol a long time. I'd say, guess what? I got saved. I got born again. Boy, you, you talk about a, a different thing happening. Instead of embracing me the way they used to, they backed up. Then I told them, and I've told you this, but if you don't mind, I'll tell you again, because I've never understood it, and they certainly couldn't figure it out. I said, not only that, but bless your heart, he called me to preach the word of God. Amen. It's like a vacuum sucked all the air out of it. And some of them was honest enough to tell me of all the people that I would figure God would have called to preach the word of God, you would have been the last one. I believe that too. I don't know why he did it. But I'm glad he did it. The pastor come to me and says, Brother, will you preach Sunday night? I didn't say, oh, oh, okay. But pastor, didn't I tell you I'd love to? I'd love to. Now, I don't know whether you, I mean, preachers are in here, but my wife will tell you when I go and tell her, I'm going to preach Sunday night. She knows what's fixing to happen. Devil don't like preachers anyway, and he don't like the word of God. And when he hears that one of them's preaching, he makes it a little bit rougher in the house and then what's going on. Yeah. He had the audacity to tell me, You you ain't good enough to preach. I said, You're right. <laughs> no argument here. You don't deserve it, you deserve hell. Absolutely. If I was God, I, I've told God before, I said, God, I'd have killed me a long time ago if I was you. You ever do that? You say, you're crazy. No, when I get to a point God can't use me to be a help to God's people and can't use me to give out the Word of God and can't use me to show people the love of Christ, then I just soon go. I, I, I have no reason to be here anymore. Amen. God wants all of you and all of me so that we can have all of Him and He can give us all the blessings that He has for His children. Isn't that wonderful? We talk about revival. Pastor said people want to you know, get them a speaker to come in and have revival. They don't, it ain't revival. One of the biggest revivals I had in my heart was right up in Union County, Union Chapel Baptist Church up on the hill, mowing the grass, Pastor, of all things. 
out there mowing the grass. And all of a sudden the wind comes through and starts moving the pine trees. Next thing I knew, the Holy Spirit landed in there and moved me and I went down. Amen. Best revival I ever been to. And when I got up, I got home and I told her about it and I told the church about it. Guess what? I didn't just preach the word of God. I preached it with joy for the Holy Spirit. Amen. Did you want revival? Well, he'll give it to you. You mean you ain't got it, pastor, preacher? Oh, I do not care or does any other spokesman or preacher come into a church carrying revival. You're carrying revival inside you. And I'm carrying revival inside me. And the only way it'll get turned loose is when we're ready to give Jesus all of you and all of me so that he can give us all of the joy and all of the power of God and the Holy Spirit to lift us up and turn us loose. I preach a lot of so-called revivals. When I was a young preacher, I was even not think that was it. Oh, they shouted. I come out there with my spiritual six guns loaded. <laughs> Going off like a tongue again. I preach so hard. I, I think some people got up there just because they got scared to death. But you know what I found out? About 10 days to two weeks later, the revival had left. Why? I don't think it ever was there. It was a man-made, worked-up meeting. Do y'all really want revival in here? Well, let's find out in our prayer closets what God's trying to put his finger on tonight. Amen? You say, I'm, I have no sin in my life right now, preacher. You're one of the biggest liars I've ever met in my life. God said we're sinners. He tells us not to sin. He says, but when we do sin, did you catch that? When we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father. And His name's Jesus Christ. I'm glad for that. If I had to plead my own case, I'd, I'd be in trouble. How many people? It's quiet, isn't it? Surely, surely I didn't finally get something that I questioned and the Word of God answered and given to me on this particular evening after my pastor got touched by the Holy Spirit of God and told somebody that they needed something from Jesus. Surely, surely, God didn't do that when you and I are sitting here in good shape. Amen. There's none of us righteous, no, not one. There's only one person that is good. And Jesus said his name was God. And God said his name is Jesus. What are you going to do with it tonight? Now, I've I know I'm not the best teacher in the world and I certainly never have made a claim to be the best preacher in the world. I, I really, I really believe I'm one of probably the weakest preachers. But you've got the truth. And I think it was laid out in a very simple way because Jesus wants all of you. How much of Jesus do you want? I love him. Then turn yourself fully over to Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, now I'm going to pray with you, and I, I'm 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 done. I'm out of soap. I'm out of clothes. I I'm out of everything. When the pastor comes up here. If God put His finger on something, tonight, it'd be a real good thing. 
real good thing to accept it. You know what? I, can I give you... I can't prove it in the Word of God, but can I just give you an opinion? You remember, you remember when they were coming to take Jesus, that all of a sudden out of the blue comes this, this person in a white robe. Yeah. All of a sudden, out of nowhere. I mean, what's he doing? Or what's, what's his purpose there? Yeah. You ever wonder that? What's his purpose there? Now, this is what I believe. If I'm wrong, we'll talk it over in glory one day. But I'm going to tell you what I believe. My opinion. I believe that man that was in that white robe, it says when they laid hands on him, he ran and left the road and went off naked. I believe that very same person there quite possibly could have been this rich young ruler that was sad and rejected Christ when God put his finger on it and made it so simple. And step by step, he lost the worldly riches that he had. And even when Jesus Christ was fixing to go to the cross, one last chance. One last chance. I read nowhere else where a chance was given. He said, Brother Tom, I don't believe that. We don't have to because that's I can't back up more to God, but I believe it. God don't put something in the middle of nowhere for no reason. Amen. All right, now we'll pray. Pastor, I hope that was all right for me giving up. Just an opinion of that. I'm not saying that's scripture, but I believe that. All right. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. I thank you so much for this church. God, this church has been a bless, blessing to me and my family. You gave us a, you gave us a good pastor with a right heart and a, a good pastor's wife, somebody to help him. And God, I, I just love this church. And God, I, I thank you for showing me what had bothered me for a while from those scriptures. God, I want you to take all of me because I'm nothing without you. God, I want the same thing for every member of this church. And God, there's one here tonight that don't know you and your free pardon of sin or walking a very fine tightrope right now. And God, I ask that you touch them and you draw them and you save them and God, that you give them the blessings that you have for your children. Now, blessed Holy Spirit, touch the hearts. Help us to be humble tonight and help us to be honest with you. We would see your Son lifted high and glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you, Pastor.